welcome to the Big Bass Podcast. His name is Terry Battisti. And his name is Ken Duke. Our producer and our engineer is Nathan Benson. This episode is H.W. Ross, and his could have been, would have been a record in the story that starts almost 140 years ago. Terry, this is one of my absolute favorite stories of, of lost lunkers. You know, a giant fish that has kind of been lost to history. Um, I, I think just about anybody who's even remotely serious about bass fishing knows about George Perry and the 22-pound, four-ounce fish he allegedly caught in 1932. And and a lot of people certainly know about Manabu Kurita and his 22-pound, five-ounce fish that he caught back in 2009. If you're really pretty hardcore, uh, you know about Fritz Friebel and, and a fish he caught back in 1923 that weighed 20 pounds, two ounces. But almost nobody, almost nobody knows about this fish uh, that was allegedly caught by H.W. Ross back in 1884. And this fish weighed 23 and a half pounds. And there's a pretty fair argument, Terry, that this fish should be the all-tackle world record largemouth bass even today. It, yeah, you know, it, whenever you have, you know, someone saying that they caught a 23-pound, 8-ounce fish, you know, red flags are going to come up in the whole nine yards. You know, you, you're talking about a fish that was caught in the 1880s. There were no, but there was nobody keeping records at the time. So we don't know what type of a scale this fish was weighed on. You know, uh, obviously, you know, we're going to get further in this story. H.W. Uh, Ross went to great lengths to document this fish, what he did. Um, but it's 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 really, really difficult to, to look because records weren't started. They didn't start keeping track of records until 1930. Uh, and it was Field and Stream that, that, that did that through their, you know, yearly or their annual fish, fishing contest, which, you know, the person that submitted the biggest fish of a certain species, uh, you know, they, they, they sent it in. They had to have it, you know, notarized in the whole nine yards, and they got 50 or or $100 worth of tackle for, you know, their, their pains. Uh, so, you know, the, they're in – how do you consider something that's 140 years old? I don't know, but let's go through that argument because we got a bunch of pluses and a bunch of negatives. Actually, I think we have more pluses than negatives as to why H.W. Ross should be considered for the world record. Yeah, and, and you know, for me, it all started in, in reading uh, James Henshaw's great book, More About the, ba the Black Bass. It was his follow-up to uh, Book of the Black Bass that was published in 1881. Eight years later, he comes out with more about the black bass. And, and Henshaw, of course, is, uh, I, I think, the greatest writer in the history of the sport of bass fishing and, and, and certainly the most important. And I think that uh, when he started writing about the size that bass could attain, there he is. He's got the book right there, More About the Black Bass by James A. Henshaw. Uh, he started talking about the, That's the, the three, size three bass shed. could attain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, republished by Bass in 1989, in fact. Yeah. Um, uh, Henshaw tells a, a little story about the fish and and and, and the claims of, of Ross and catching it. So then I started doing a little more research. And, and at the time I first heard about the Ross fish, it was a dead end. You know, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have Google. We didn't have Ancestry.com or Newspaper.com. Or newspaperarchives.com. But when I when with all the tools we have today, I was able to, to dig in and I found an article. I found an article. I cannot you know how geeky I am, so you know how excited I, I was when I found this article. Uh, published in 14 different newspapers, Terry, in nine different states. California, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin all published the same story between August 25th and October 10th, 1884. So uh, and if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read it to you. It's pretty short. It starts with a quote from the angler himself. I had no idea black bass ever grew so large, 
said H.W. Ross of Jacksonville, Florida, a few days ago, until I succeeded in landing one that cost me 40 minutes of hard work. It measured 37 and a half inches from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail, was 29 and a half inches in girth, and weighed 23 pounds and 8 ounces. I had gone with two friends to N-Town Creek near Altoona to fish. After filling our minnow bucket, we fished in a lake formed by the creek, which contained some four acres with water 30 feet deep. I was lazily holding an eight ounce pole when suddenly my float sank and away went my line at lightning speed. The fish made straight for the center of the lake and it was only with the greatest circumspection that I succeeded in heading him toward shore. The bass was hooked about 12 feet from the surface of the water, and he did not show himself above the surface at any time. When he was finally pulled into the boat, he came with his mouth wide open, and to all appearances was dead. He never flopped once after he was landed. I never heard of so large a black bass being taken before. And that's the whole story. And it's almost entirely a quote from Ross. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, you, you know, let's let's kind of pick this story apart. You know, a 40-minute fight? Holy mackerel. I mean, you know, I, I've watched Oliver Nye's, you know, catch or, or cast catch and, and boat video of the 17, almost 18-pounder. Uh, that thing took him three minutes to get into the boat and that was a yeah, fresh and butch fish. brown butch brown butch on brown. cast to catch 18 pounds yeah. nine ounces or something and it's just a couple yeah. of minutes if that it might be less than a minute i haven't sat down and, and timed it yeah it, it, you know so right right there it's like yeah okay so we caught it on an eight ounce rod if you don't know what that means uh that was a pretty heavy rod back in the day it would be what we would consider probably a medium heavy action rod at the time would you agree ken i would absolutely agree and and, you know, and who knew? To, to your point about Go 40 ahead. minutes there's no way there's no way you fight a bass for 40 minutes none <laughs> that fish is dead that fish is dead yeah. i'm not sure you could fight a bass for even 10 minutes and, and legitimately be trying to get it in the boat for 10 minutes and not kill it um yeah. but there is, uh, I think there is some extenuating circumstances here. And, and those extenuating circumstances come up in the next passage I want to read, which is from Henshaw's More About the Black Bass. And this is the first, the first I ever heard of the Ross Bass. I think it's the first you had ever heard of the Ross Bass as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and here's, what, here's what James Henshaw, the, the greatest bass writer of all time, uh, an absolutely essential guy in the history of our sport. He says, Mr. H.W. Ross, when in Florida, caught in a clear, deep, lily-bound lake near Altoona in that state, a large-mouthed black bass, which he states weighed 23 and one-eighth pounds and measured from tip of nose to tip of tail 37 and one-half inches and in girth 29 and one-half inches. The head of this fish was sent to the office of Forest and Stream in New York, and its dimensions were given by the editor as follows. Its maxillary bone measures four and three-fourths inches. The head is seven and one-half inches from the tip of the upper jaw to the end of the upper curl, and the lower jaw projects one inch. The greatest girth of the head is 16 and one-half inches. So the, the thing that caught my eye there, Terry, and I know it caught yours too, was the lily-bound part. Yeah. Uh, yep. You're in Florida. And that's the only way. It, that's the, if that fish got hung up in the in the pads. I mean, maybe. And you know, they're not. They don't have troll motors. They're using rowboats. You know, all that crap. Um, you know, maybe that fish got so stuck in the pads that it took him 40, 40 minutes to do some gardening. I, I think that's the only explanation. But I also think it's kind of legitimate. I. I live in Florida. I live not far from where this uh, allegedly happened. And, and I can tell you that lily pads are, are a part of almost every body of water in central Florida. Um, 
I think if this guy hooked a gigantic bass and it got hung up in the pads, because one of the things he said was that the bass was hooked about 12 feet from the surface of the water. A lot of room down there to get hung up in the pads. Mm -hmm. um, if he had it pinned against the pads for a long period of time, that would explain 40 minutes. It would also explain why when he kind of finally pulled this fish into the boat, it was dead as a hammer. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's no I way mean, a fish you, were to survive that. You, you bring a fish in, you know, with a bunch of salad around it, and you put it on the deck, it doesn't do anything. And even after you get the salad off of it, they don't, they don't do much. So, yeah, maybe there's some credibility there. That is so true. Yeah, anybody who's ever pulled a fish through hydrilla or, or any kind of vegetation like that, milfoil, you know, as soon as those fish get mired up in that stuff, they – you're just you're just winding them in. But so in here's, pads, a I, here's a question. Here's a question. I was just I gonna have. say in in pads, you know, you're up against that stem, and it's very difficult to uproot that stem. You you get, you get hung up in pads, you go in and get them, uh, or you don't get them at all usually. Right. So I have a question. Not having spent much time in Florida or fishing Florida, do pads grow in twelve foot of water? I, I always envisioned pads being in like five foot and, and less. Oh, well, obviously, like any other kind of vegetation, it has a lot to do with clarity, water clarity. Uh -huh. You can occasionally get pads that deep. It's not ordinary. They usually grow on a mucky bottom, but they can absolutely grow in, in water that deep in places in Florida. And, uh, you know, when, when Henshaw and Ross describe this place as clear, that's pretty common. Water in Florida tends to be very clear. It may be tannin stained, uh, which is what gives tea its brown color, but it's going to be typically clear. And lily bound, that's not uncommon at all. What is uncommon is deep. You know, Ross describes it as 30 feet deep. And maybe he, he measured it, uh, but that's quite deep for most Florida fisheries. Uh, but, but, you know. but also, I mean, you have a lot of sinkhole lakes in Florida, and it's isn't it possible that he could have been fishing one of those places. Absolutely. In fact, there is a lake up in the uh, uh, Jacksonville, northeast Florida area uh, called Kingsley. And, and they believe it was created by a, a meteor strike. And and if you look at it topographically, it looks like a, somebody jammed an ice cream cone into the sand. <laughs> it's got water 90 feet deep. And, wow. uh, and it, it's kind of a, a weird geographical formation. Uh, but... To have water 30 feet deep in a natural body of water in Florida, absolutely, absolutely could happen. Yeah. Not, yeah. The other, not the other common, thing that struck, but possible. Right. The other thing that struck me was the fact that Ross actually sent this fish, the skeleton, to New York to have it examined by IS. You know, he says it was Forest and Stream, which Field and Stream ended up purchasing in the 30s. Uh, but he sent it to Forest and Stream, and I would assume that Forest and Stream would have hired some biologists to actually look at the fish and take those measurements. So uh, uh, they absolutely might have. I mean, we're we're talking about a historically large fish. You'd like to think that somebody of uh, scientific import took a look. We don't know. What we do know is all on in that regard is all from Henshaw, because Henshaw mm -hmm. is the only one who tells us that uh, the head of the fish was sent to the Office of Forest and Stream, and the editor uh, reported its dimensions. Yeah. And he's not getting those from Ross. He's getting that information from the editors at Forest and Stream, which, as you say, was a, uh, was a, was, was a very prominent outdoor magazine in the 1880s. Uh, by, 19, by the 1920s, it had, it had seen better days. It got purchased by Field and Stream in 1930, I think. But that was a that was a heralded and respected publication back in 1884, and uh, for Ross to have you know have had the presence of mind to send that in to the editors of a major outdoor publication like that shows uh, shows some prescience there. <laughs> He's he he wanted that fish to be appreciated on some level. Well, but he had nothing to gain at all for sending that fish in. 
right? Ah, uh, well, we, 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 yeah, exactly. But we're going to get into that a little deeper <laughs> yeah. in a little bit later because because <laughs> I think that that goes directly to uh, to some credibility aspects here, right? Uh, yeah, and not only credibility in the story of H. W. Ross and this twenty three pound eight ounce fish, but you're going to see credibility issues on so many of the shows that we're going to be doing for you here at the big bass podcast. Yeah. Credibility absolutely. is probably going to be a word that we, I bet you, I bet you we use the word credibility on almost every show we do from here on out. And I hope we do hundreds of them. Uh, yeah. it's such a big word, such a big yeah. word. So I, one of the things, you know, I mean, essentially we have some interesting dimensions based on the head of this fish. I don't know that, at least I know of no, no one else that's actually measured the maxillary bone uh, or, you know, measured the, the girth or the circumference of the head, you know, at, at its, you know, biggest portion, biggest part. Um, I would be interested now in, in asking anybody out there, if you catch a big fish, you know, even an 18 pounder or a 15 pounder or something like that, kind of take measurements like this so we know what to compare to. That would be an interesting study, I think. But then again, I'm a geek, so. Yes, you are a geek. I, I'll agree with that part. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anytime you have these dimensions that are that are so specific and and so seemingly exact, that's impressive. That that adds a lot of credence to, to any story like that. And, and you know, one of the things right. uh, I think that's fair to point out is that uh, James Henshaw was a physician. He was a medical doctor from Cincinnati. And, and and when you read his stuff, you realize the appreciation he has for science, for precision. And uh, he doesn't just throw okay. terms around. He He's usually got a lot of specifics to back it up. Yeah. And, and when he tells this story, you know, we're going to make some comments about uh, – We want, I want to talk about what his attitudes seem to be about the fish. But what is clear is he's giving the best measurements, the best information he has in it, and he's being very precise about it, just as H.W. Just as Ross was. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of H.W. Ross, you've done a lifetime worth of research on this man. Who was he? Oh, it seems like it. seems like I've been studying this guy forever. And uh, it was only a short time before we recorded this show that I finally tracked down H.W. Ross. And I'm sad to report that he is no longer with us. Uh, but that's not surprising <laughs> since he'd have been about 200 something, almost 200 years old. But uh, yeah, it took forever because, you know, there's, there's so very little information about this guy. Uh, you know, the only information I had on him and it, well, the only information you get from Henshaw is that he caught this fish while in Florida. He opens his, his little story up by saying, H.W. Ross went in Florida. I said, oh, man, I don't know if he's from New York and visiting Florida. I don't know if he lives in Florida. I don't know what the situation is. Luckily, the story that appeared in, in those 14 papers in nine different states, it said H.W. Ross of Jacksonville, Florida. But Ross is a pretty common name. And, and Jacksonville is not you know, a tiny town, even then it was not big by any means, but that's all I had to go on. And uh, so I started digging into some genealogy records. I started digging into some newspaper records. I had no first or middle name. I just had HW, um, a very common surname, a hometown. That's not a lot to go on. Didn't know his age, didn't know his occupation, didn't have any family members. My first break was I, I caught a glimpse of an H.W. Ross in a newspaper story talking about the hunting exploits of a well-known Civil War veteran named Shipley. And uh, I said, aha, I got a little something here. I got, I got something just to, to get my claws on and, and try to dig in deeper. And, and it said that H.W. <coughs> Ross was this guy's nephew. So Ross is Shipley's nephew. Now I got you, brother. Now, now you're mine. Because now I can find out who Shipley's siblings were. And I came up with a, I came up on a blank. I didn't have any Shipley sisters who married a guy named Ross. So that was depressing. 
But then I checked his wife. And she didn't have any siblings who married a Ross. But then I checked his second wife. Who he married later in life and who he didn't have any children with. But yeah, one of those sisters, one of his second wife's sisters married a guy named Ross. They had a kid. Uh, that kid was H.W. Ross. And, and I was so excited to find that out, you know, um, <laughs> because I, I didn't think I'd ever I'd ever find this guy. Uh, just just ridiculous. But I finally found the man. I, I can tell you that um, he was born Horace Warren Ross. He was born in 1852 somewhere in the state of New York. That makes him 31 or 32 years old when he caught this giant fish. Um, he, at some point in the 1870s, he moved to Dubuque, Iowa, got married, had three kids. He and his family, they moved to Jacksonville in the early 1880s, just before he caught this fish. And they lived there, apparently lived there, all of them lived the remainder of their lives in, uh, in North Florida. Um, According to uh, the 1891 Jacksonville, Florida address directory, he worked as a traveling agent. And, and Terry, I guess that probably means he was a salesman of some kind. And he uh, died in the late 1890s, probably in 1899. And I say that because that's the year uh, that his wife applied to get his military pension. And uh, so he probably died at the age of 47 or 48. And in the 1900 census, only a year later, she is listed as a, a, a head of household. And in later censuses, she's listed as a widow. So uh, I found H.W. Ross. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> it shows the uh, level of gonna... my disease. Yeah, yeah. You know, I call myself a geek, but I think you're like King Geek or something like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, that, that nickname could stick. Oh, golly. All right, so what? so let's try to make a case for Horace Ross and his 23-pound, 8-ounce fish that he supposedly caught uh, in Florida in 1884. So what do we know about the catch? Well, he tells us it weighed 23.8, and that's uh, more than any other bass that's ever been recognized as a world record. Uh, we all remember Dottie from about 17, 18 years ago when she was caught from Lake Dixon in California and weighed 25-1, but was not a world record because she was snagged. She had been caught a couple other times, but she was snagged at the point when she would have exceeded the world record. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, the editor and staff of Forest and Stream magazine had uh, access to this fish, and they measured it pretty meticulously. Um, we know that Field and Stream later bought Forest and Stream, so they should have had access to this information as well, though we have yeah. no indication that they ever knew of the fish. Um, uh, we, know, we know the fish came from the right place. We know that no fish approaching 20 pounds has ever lacked Florida genetics. So yeah. it came from the right place. Uh, Altoona is a little town in uh, Lake County, Florida. It's about an hour north of me. I live in the Orlando area. Um, we know that Ross didn't adhere to any of the traditional record keeping standards because there were no world records then. there were no standards then. there was no requirement of a photograph or a witness statement or a notary uh, signature like or anything the line, like that. You know, all that, yeah. Exactly. Nothing like no certi no post certification of the scales. Nothing like that. Um, we know that he had no incentive to lie about this fish. None at yeah. all. There was no bounty, no endorsements to get, no contest to win, no expectation of fame and fortune. Yep. But the coolest thing we know, I'm going to throw it right back to you. The coolest <laughs> thing we know is is where this fish lands given the measurements we have on what i want to call the batisti system because folks yeah. what you don't know <laughs> about my podcast partner here 
is he calls me the king geek. No. 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 I am not the king geek. That's the king geek right over there. <laughs> he's got a he's got a PhD in <clears throat> chemical engineering. He uh, he has a slide rule in one pocket and an abacus in the other at all times. This this image you see of him on the screen right now is the first time I've ever seen him without a pocket protector. Okay, so <laughs> that's Terry Battisti, and he also has no come judgment. up with no judgment. <laughs> too late. Uh, he also has come up with the most sophisticated, most exact, most precise, most effective method of using things like length and girth measurements to estimate the weight of a largemouth bass. And so with that, I hand it over to Dr. Terry Battisti. That was way too much, Ken. <laughs> anyway. We'll, we'll take it all out uh, in post-production. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was back, uh, I don't remember the exact year. Uh, it was the, the year that Leah True caught that 18 pound, or excuse me, the 20, 22 pound, eight ounce or whatever the heck that fish was out of Northern California. And the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame accepted it as the world record for the largemouth bass. Oh, and I got a, Yeah. And I got a phone call at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday from Doug Stangy from Mid Fisherman asking me if I would be interested in doing a, an article for InFish on record hoaxes. And, I mean, it's Doug Stangy, it's in Fisherman. He knows that I'm was heavily into the, 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 the world record chase back then and documenting it. And I, I couldn't say no. So, you know, kind of worked up. Wait, a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There was, there was uh, investigation, history, math, and bass fishing involved, and you couldn't say no? Exactly. I mean, holy mackerel. I mean, it was a gift, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the Batiste Grand Slam. Yeah. So we kind of, you know – worked out a, 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 an idea of what the article would be. And about a week later, I'd been thinking about it. And, you know, all these hoaxes that had been done prior, you know, um, they essentially just weigh the fish and, you know, say that it weighs, you know, 24 pounds or, or what have you. Uh, and, you know, then the fish gets, you know, blown out of the water and nobody ever hears from that person again. And I kept thinking that when a fish gets to be over like 12 or 14 pounds, their dimensions go, go crazy. They, if they end up growing, you know, wider than they do length. And the fish, we, we, people call them formulas, but they're really models of, uh, of what a fish should weigh based on measurements. And I thought, you know, I need to come up with a model of big fish, fish that are, you know, over 14 pounds. Um, and with that, maybe we would be able to predict what some of these hoaxes weighed. And, and so I called Doug back up and I said, Hey man, I got an idea. Uh, I have the, I have the background in math in order to do this. All I have to do is find the data. So I called Larry Botroff at San Diego uh, Parks, and Larry gave me every single bit of data that he had ever accrued in San Diego, uh, handwritten. I mean, it was just amazing. Um, and Botroff, for, for the folks out there who are not familiar with that name, uh, he has probably handled more 15-pound-plus largemouth than any other human being in the history of the world. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, and so I called Larry. Larry gave me his data. Uh, I got a hold of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Division because they make big bass down there, too. And and they gave me, I think at the time, uh, their data had 350 fish in it. So I had 400, 450 fish that were documented. Length, girth, and and weight, uh, all certified by biologists. And if I could use that data, develop a model, do the, the statistics on it, maybe I could come up with a model that would accurately predict these fish. 
So I ran the model. I left, I left a couple fish out. I left the George Perry fish out because I wanted to confirm whether or not Perry's fish would have weighed what it did. I left Leah True's fish out of it, and I left a couple of other ones out uh, because if you fit your model with those fish, then your model is going to have – it's going to be affected by those fish. And so I left them out of the model completely, did the stats, and then finished the model and plugged those fish back in. And the Perry fish, uh, I predicted, uh, was going to weigh in that, you know – 20, I think it was 22 pounds, a half, uh, let me, let me pull it up here real quick. Uh, the Perry fish was, uh, tw between 21 and a half and 22 and a half pounds. So statistically the Perry fish weighs what it, what he said it did. Uh, and then I stuck the true fish measurements, the Leah true fish measurements in there and, it came out to be between 18 pounds even and 18 and three quarter pounds, which if you look at the picture and you have any experience looking at big fish, you, you see that picture and you instantly say that's an 18 pound fish. So enough of the model. We then uh, put in H.W. Ross's measurements, 37 and a half inches in length, 29 and a half inches in girth, and the model spit out 24 pounds, 24.34 pounds, all right? So part of my statistics is, okay, I use length to girth ratios. Uh, and if I have the length to girth ratio, that number, I can look and see what, where my model is off and how much it is for a fish with that length to girth ratio. And my model typically predicts for that length to girth ratio, which was roughly 1.3, it predicts high by 7%, which means that that 24.34 pound fish was probably closer to 22.64 pounds. Those two numbers are, they, they bracket the 23 pound eight ounce almost perfectly. Absolutely so, perfectly. So 23 eight is dead in the middle of those numbers. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it gave me chills when I, I saw that number uh, because it's like, holy crap, maybe he wasn't, maybe that this fish really did exist. So there you have it. I mean, that, uh, you know, when we look at all the reasons to believe, disbelieve the Ross story, when you put that fish in your system and it came out, dead on basically the weight he claimed that that really that really uh, made some points with me but you know <laughs> there's also there's also plenty of arguments against ross plenty of reason oh. to think that his story is apocryphal or or just wildly off for one reason or another and, and one is uh we don't know who he fished with we don't have any we know he fished with two people because he said he was with two friends and uh, we don't know who they are. We never heard from them. We don't have any way to know if those scales were accurate or certified or anything else. We just know yeah. he said it weighed 23.8. We don't have any photographs. That's not unusual. It was 1884. Uh, having your photograph taken in 1884 was kind of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> not like today. Um, there are no published reports of the fish from the state of Florida where it was caught. But I'll say it was an extremely rural area of Florida. I think Disney World was just breaking ground. No, I'm kidding. We were still <laughs> 80 years away from Disney World. Um, and it started so, in California. Well, whatever. <laughs> By the way, he's from California. I'm from Florida. I'm an American. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know. You're just northern Cuba down there, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> they got big bass there too. Treasure Lake. Uh, we're going to have stories about that too. Um, but, you know, so it doesn't bother me that there's no stories out of Florida on it. But one thing that I think is kind of interesting and telling is to look at what James Henshaw 
seemed to believe about the fish. And I know you and I have looked at that and tried to, tried to, you know, like creep inside the mind of uh, bass fishing's greatest writer and figure out his thoughts on the Ross fish, which he commented on in 1889. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. I mean, he writes about it in 1889 in his book, uh, but then he doesn't definitively, you know, give it anything when, when all of a sudden, you know, Field and Stream starts, you know, posting world records or what have you. They, yeah, it was, it's kind of strange. Yeah, he knew, Henshaw knew that 20 pound fish lived in Florida because he claimed he had caught one. He claimed he had caught one uh, that weighed 20 pounds. And, uh, and that's interesting that he said that. But what to me is even more interesting is he said he caught that fish in 1878 and that he considered it the record. And when he said he considered it the record, he was speaking in, in the early around 1920. So, Mm -hmm. you know, almost 40 years after the Ross fish was caught, uh, in no way did he really endorse the Ross fish. He appeared to be at least moderately skeptical of it. Maybe he was just jealous of it. It's hard to say, uh, yeah. but he believed that his twenty was the record, and, and said yeah, so. It, it, yeah, I mean, how, how can you state in the eight eighteen eighties that someone caught a twenty three eight, and then forty years later say that you're you 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 have the world record with a twenty pounder? It doesn't make sense. Not a lot, not a lot of sense, but yeah, it's hard to say. And, and, you know, time is, is, uh, simultaneously fascinating and, and frustrating to me. You know, I wish we could talk to the editor of forest and stream magazine, talk to the guys who fish with Ross, talk to H, you know, talk to HW Ross, obviously, uh, talk to Henshaw about it because that would be a heck yeah. of a dinner party, you know? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, that would not that would not be too shabby a dinner party right there uh if yeah. you're into if you're into big bass which we are obviously but yeah. uh <laughs> you know in in considering all the stuff we've been talking about about this ross fish 23 pounds eight ounces caught in 1884 um i want to get your take on on whether you think it should have been recognized as a world record but first I'm going to jump the gun here and give you my take because uh, I want to give you a chance to consider it and and figure out where you stand. But I'm going to throw my my take on it out there first, because believe it or not, I'm not I'm not one known for nuance or subtlety. But uh, I think my opinion is a little bit nuanced here. I, I will say this. I will say. Number one, I believe H.W. Ross caught a 23-pound, 8-ounce largemouth in 1884 out of a deep, clear, lily-bound lake near Altoona, Florida. I believe it. And and this is not just a um, Fox Mulder, I want to believe, UFO poster here. This is looking at, at all the evidence. Um, the fish came from the right place. Central Florida is the right place. There's genetics are there. The habitat's there. Um, he met every reasonable standard that you could have possibly established for that time. You know, he weighed the fish, he measured it. He even sent the carcass to an outdoor publication. Um, in fact, the one that would eventually be sold to the primary record keeping organization, uh, for most of the 20th century, Ross had zero incentive to fabricate this catch. There was no prize. There was no bounty. There were no endorsements to be had. There was no celebrity to be made over this fish. Um, everything he did, he did with no hope of benefit to himself. But the biggest thing that, that makes me a believer 
after all of this. Those are all great points, and that makes me lean quite strongly. But then you put him on the Battisti formula, and the Battisti formula tells you that a fish of, of that length, which is extraordinarily long, it's the only fish I've ever heard of of that length. Yeah. I mean, it was like what, you, six inches longer than Perry's fish. Well, it's five inches longer than Perry's fish. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's got more girth than the Perry's fish. Yeah. But uh, 37 and a half inches long. Now, here in Florida, where fish tend to be quite long, longer than other parts of the country, uh, you'll occasionally hear of a 30-inch fish, a 31-inch fish. But I've also heard of some fish that were gargantuan and, and in, well up in the teens that were as long as Perry's fish, you know, 32, maybe 33 inches. 37 and a half is, is a reach. But when you plug that into the Batisti formula and, and you get not – not a little bit high, not a little bit low, but but dead on the mark, dead on the mark at twenty three eight. That that carries a lot of weight with me, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> so I believe the man caught that fish. I believe that maybe it should have been the world record, but I don't think it should be the world record today because. Nobody was keeping records then. There were no rules. There were no standards for record keeping. And until those were established, uh, even very weakly in the early days of the field and stream contest, very weak standards, really, uh, I don't think a record set under those circumstances should probably be recognized. So I believe the man caught a 23-pound, 8-ounce bass. Uh... I believe he should be celebrated for that on some level, but I don't believe he should have the world record. What do you think, doctor? Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, and I don't believe Perry should. Well, damn it. We don't have a show. If you agree with me, you have to take me apart. <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with you, you know, primarily, I, I, I think he probably caught a 23, eight fish. All right. Um, but I don't think that he should be in the record books. And I will also say that I don't think Perry should be in the record books anymore as the one that owns the world record. I think Corita needs to be in the record books. Um, I mean, who, was the scale that Perry's fish was weighed on? Was it, was it right? You know, I don't know. I just, I think that we have a contemporary fish that broke the record and it should be given to him. That's my opinion. We're going to dig into the Perry thing and the Carita thing and, and all of those in, in future issues and episodes rather of the big bass podcast. But uh, that's interesting. You know, we've got all these different components of uh, Horace Ross and, uh, and we're still, still pretty much on the same page. So, that's kind of cool. To be honest I like with it. you, I, I wish Mac would not have snagged that fish. And I know he didn't. I don't think he snagged it on purpose. All right? Talk about Mac Weekly with Mac Dottie Weekly. on Lake Dixon yeah. in what was that, about 2006? 2006 or, so? or something like that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think it was 2006. And it, 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 there's sight fish in this fish in like 15 foot of water. And, you know, he sees the fish flare its gills on a jig. He sweeps and snags the fish supposedly foul hooks the fish yeah now for for everybody's edification here hadn't planned on going into this one we got we'll have this later also but um to set an igfa record you have to adhere to state law state law in california says that if you snag a fish it's not lawfully caught can't be considered for record status so uh ultimately mac weekly decided not to submit that fish for record consideration. It weighed 25 pounds, one ounce on uncertified scales. But clearly, I, I say clearly, I believe it's the biggest bass anyone has ever seen anywhere, certainly yeah. in my lifetime. Um, yeah. And it's not the world record. Yep. Yeah. So. But I don't, I'm glad he didn't catch it fair and square because a 25 pound one, Puts everybody out of the record chasing game. 
Who's going to try to catch a world record at 25 1? Everybody's going to say, uh, what's, yeah. what's the world record, Bluegill? You know, they're going to go after yeah. something else. Uh, go with the wine class records, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, wine class records. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh. Fly fishing records. <laughs> oh, fly, fi- man. fly fishing is cool. Line class records. I don't know. We're gonna yeah. we'll probably take on some line class records issues, but uh, but they're uh, uh, you got to you got you'll drag me kicking and screaming after some of those. Yeah. Uh, but I tell you what, folks, that's good. That's a wrap for this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. I'm Ken Duke, and I'm Terry Batiste. Again, our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. Look who's here. Nathan Benson himself, <laughs> producer, engineer nice. extraordinaire, one of the smartest guys we know. Yep. So thanks for joining us. Sincerely hope that you enjoyed the program. If you did, please rate, shape, you know, like, uh, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, we, we hear, you know, that's important, you know, for, for our ratings and all that, and all that stuff. So. Uh, anything that you can do to help us spread the word, uh, grow our audience is much appreciated. Send a letter or telegram to a friend telling him about this new technology called podcast. <laughs> Recommend this one. Yeah. The other guys don't need your help. We desperately need your help. And we love you. We love you. Yep. <laughs> and All if right. you need to reach us, if you want to, if you want to reach out and tell us how we did, tell us if it was good, if it was bad, what we can do different, maybe a story you would like to hear uh, told in the future, our email addresses are right here. He said, knowing that Nathan would put the email addresses in later so that everybody yeah. could see it. Uh, and, and if you email us, we're going to get back to you. We, we love hearing from folks who are just as interested and passionate about Big Bass as we are. And uh, hey, if you want to sponsor the show, we will respond to your emails or calls really, really fast. Like faster than the internet, because we'd like to. We'd love to have sponsors. You know, we, yep. we we'd love to have support for the show. We do this because we love it, and we hope that's obvious and apparent. But uh, as I like to say, we also like to eat and live indoors. So a sponsorship would be much appreciated. Yep. All right, hey Ken, I think it was uh, a good one. Right. I think it's our best show ever. Quite honestly, Terry. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, go that and, far. And, yep, and uh, I guess uh, we got something else that we got to cook up for next week. Uh, we're going to work on it, but we're not going to tease it here because we're not exactly sure which one we're going to go with next week. But we promise you that whatever show we have next week, whatever big bass we're talking about, we're going to have some information that you didn't know before, and uh, yeah. we're going to offer some insight you haven't seen. And and in some of these shows, we're going to bring in some some live guests. So you can hear a perspective maybe you haven't heard before. But stick with us, folks. This has been the Big Bass Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.